That should hopefully work. Is that right? Yep. Okay, so today we're going to start with James. We're going to talk primarily just about Jamestown today. So you need to be up. I know that you're probably tired. Uh, but we're going to talk about Jamestown. And Jamestown, if you look at the map here, uh, is in the Virginia colony. Uh, it sits down here. I don't know if you can see this little tiny square right there. Uh, but it sits on the water. It sits on the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so you can easily pack, you know, ship in and out from Jamestown. Um, the information I talked about in the last lecture, that time period is about four to six percent of your test when you go to the AP test, okay? From here, this is 1607. From here to 1980 is 90% of your AP test. There's a lot of information from 1607 to 1980. That's a lot of history. Um, so I'm going to, you know, make sure to emphasize key things that you need to um, notice and stuff like that. Um, so just keep that in mind. So the first thing you need to know about Jamestown, it was established as a profit-making colony. What does it mean to make profit? Make money. Make money, right? And so you had this group of men in England that pooled their money together and they uh, had this pool of money and then they sent guys over to Jamestown to start it and to hopefully make a profit on that money they pooled together. So Jamestown was called a joint stock company. You need to know that term. Joint stock company. Means that they jointly all came together, pulled their, mother, pulled their money together, and um, if you know in today's economics, um, you can buy stock in companies. That um, means that you own a share in a company. Um, and if they do well, you make money. And if they bomb, you lose money, right? COVID hit, and everyone that had, had stock lost a lot of money. I know some people lost millions. Um, it's starting to come back up now, but so it started out as a profit-making company. Um, it's named after King James. We have a new king on the throne of England. So it's named after King James, uh, who sits on the throne. Um, and uh, remember from last time, we know that Jamestown is the first permanent colony in the New World. Where Roanoke doesn't count because they're considered the lost colony. Remember, we can't. We don't know what happened to them. They all disappeared somehow. Um, so many theories. It's one of those questions that I would love to know what happened to them, right? Uh, so that's Jamestown, southern, and it is a southern colony. So as we start talking a little bit more about their crops and stuff, they are, as you look at the map, in the southern portion of the of the states. Okay, so this is called a manifest. When you go on, even today, um, if you go like on a cruise ship or something, uh, they have a manifest of all the people that were on that ship. So that if something happens, they know who's, who's there. So this is a manifest of all the people that were on the first ship to Jamestown. Uh, so all these guys, uh, the youngest one here is William Love, he's 14. Uh, the oldest is Robert Pelham at 50, 51. Uh, there's a few women in there. Um, a good number of these men are felons. Okay? So remember, the guys in Britain that are pooling their money together, they're not coming over. They're just hoping to make more money, right? So they're going to send people over that can work. And um, to a felon's perspective... You know, you don't have to do jail time in, a, in an actual jail. You can get sent on a ship and, and go work over here. I don't know what's better. Um, but a good portion of these people, probably 50-ish percent, don't make it. Okay? Uh, I want to take guesses as to why they didn't make it. Disease. Disease. Disease would be number one coming over. Malaria. So we talked about... The Europeans bring diseases to the Native Americans. They're also going to get hit because the living conditions are not very good, right? They're not getting uh, nutritious food and stuff like that. On because uh, a ship's journey is several months. It's not just a couple of days. It's a big ocean. So a lot of them die from malaria. Um, once they get here, 
a lot of them are going to die from exposure to the elements because um, you know we come they come from Europe where the house is already built for them <laughs> they, there's nothing that they have to like go out into the wild and you know chop down trees and clear land and build houses or shelters and all that good stuff so they're going to die from um, exposure um, and they're going to die from starvation they just they don't know how to live life yet in a new world so those would be probably the three biggest reasons why um, they don't make it uh, in Jamestown you are going to have mostly single men come over or men that left their families come over um, you're going to see more families when we talk about the Northeast colonies in New England uh, that come over with the Puritans and the, um, the Pilgrims. You'll see more families there. Um, so, but we got 14 to 51 there, quite a wide range. I see a lot of like 20 year olds um, in there, uh, but that's called the manifest. Um, okay, so that time period between 1607 and 1609, it's called the starving time. 1607 to 1609 is called the starving time. So these are two primary sources that if you see them on a text somewhere, you can say to yourself, oh, I know what they're talking about, right? I don't know if you can kind of tell, it's a little dark, um, but they're carrying a guy. Uh, uh, starving time. And that's what a good number of them die from, is starvation. Um, so this picture here um, is, this picture here is the starving time. This guy's sick, um, they've got their uh, fence up that's surrounding their, their area. That's got a cross on it, so that could maybe be their church, right? Um, this, if you, if you were to look more closely at it, you can see like this guy has a, a headpiece on. Um, I don't know if I can see another one. Uh, this guy, lack of clothes. So, not sure what that was. Uh, but this would also, on top of the starving time, there's gonna be conflict with the people that already live there, the Native Americans, right? And so this is showing conflict between uh, the Europeans and the Native Americans. The tribe that they had the most conflict with because they moved into their area are the Powhatan, P-O-W-H-A-T-A-N, the Powhatan. P-O-W-H-A-T-A-N. That's the tribe that lived in the area that they established Jamestown in. So they're gonna have a lot of conflict with that Indian tribe. Um, I mean, how would you feel if you considered that home and then all of a sudden this new race of people that you don't understand that come with weapons and are tearing things down take your space, right? Um, so, uh, and we're going to see some resolution between the Europeans and the Powhatan through a marriage that I'm going to talk about here in a few minutes. So, resolution this, through marriage. Yep, they're going to they're gonna fix some of the problems between the two through a specific mm -hmm. marriage that I'll talk about. So, questions about starving time? It's pretty self-explanatory, right? Uh, I think you just need to know 1607. It's like right at the beginning, 1607, 1609, until they kind of start figuring things out. Uh, so leadership comes into action, and they kind of start getting a groove on, on how to live life in the new world. Um, someone want to give me thoughts on this picture. What do you think? You think it's Pocahontas? Yeah, it is. Yeah, he's protecting that one dude from his dad killing him because he got captured. Okay, so you think this is Pocahontas? You're right, that is Pocahontas. Who is this one dude? That's that one dude, the James. James something. Not James. No, it wasn't James. James. Huh? James. James. It wasn't James. Did you ever watch the movie Pocahontas? Yes. All the colors of the wind. This is John Smith. Yeah, that's what we're <laughs> So, if you've watched Pokemon, it's just let me give you a little warning. Disney is just as much Hollywood as every other movie, right? Mm -hmm. um, they say that 
she married him and they lived happily ever after. She didn't marry him. She married another white guy, but not him. Okay? Uh, so this is the marriage, or her marriage is what I'm going to talk about. She is actually the daughter of the Powhatan chief. This is her dad. Um, and you can tell, um, it's a little blurry, but you can tell they're in their, their area because there's teepees. These guys, the Europeans didn't make teepees, right? Uh, so you can tell they're in their area. Um, other tribal members there. She's still dressed in tribal uh, clothing. Um, you can definitely tell that she is you know, Native American. Um, but that's the chief of the Powhatans. That's who they're having the majority of the conflict with. Um, one thing about this, this in, in AP US history, there are themes. And if you looked at like the textbook um, or um, different things, there are themes like um, religion, work and exchange, immigration. And there are themes that run throughout all of history, um, American US history and history throughout the world. For U.S. history, the theme that starts here that you might want to know that's gonna you're gonna see over and over in throughout the years is immigration. We think immigration because of where we live of people coming from Mexico and South America, right? That's we automatically hear that word and that's we're like, oh my gosh, it's it's illegal aliens coming from Mexico and South America. It's not just that. Even today in 2020. We have immigration up in the Pacific Northwest, where I'm from, where the primary group is Asians, people from the, the Asian Pacific. Um, and they migrate there because of the technology that's based in the Pacific Northwest, Nintendo, uh, Microsoft, um, all those places. Um, back in the 1800s, as they're coming through New York and Ellis Island, you had Chinese, German, um, Irish, all these immigration, it's, oh, and it's been a continual cycle, right? So as, and I mean, they obviously don't know the word immigration, but as they're seeing these new, differently colored people come in, dress different, talk different, what do you think their thoughts are? They might take our stuff. What else? What do you think the Powhatans and the other Native Americans are thinking? They're here to invade. What do you think they want done? They want to invade. Maybe dead. Even without violence, they're probably saying, go away. We don't want you here, right? Do we not say that same thing today? Yeah. Go away. We don't want you here, right? Everybody invades here. So we don't think of it today as invading, right? Back then, it was definitely more of an invasion because... So few people. Yeah. Did, did Indians know that there's um, other people? Like. No, in their minds, the only other people would be the, would be other. So they could think that those were like real aliens or something. I don't know that they had that concept. I mean, we do because science has. But I thought the Mayans did the same thing. Gods, not aliens. Gods. So if they came in peace, well, and that's what the Aztecs did, right? Hernan Cortes came, and they thought he was the return of their god. Yes. So not, I don't think you have the concept of aliens, because at that point in time, science is not advanced enough to have a concept of aliens. different um, spaces, you know, and galaxies, and you, you know what I mean? So I don't know that that concept yet, but gods, for sure, because they, their religious beliefs are based around different gods, sun gods, rain gods. You know, they have dances to bring on rain. They have dances to bring the sun out, to have good hunting. Um, they do the um, um, sweat lodges before they go hunting to cleanse themselves and appeal to their god to make the hunt successful. Uh, young men, uh, just like with quinceañeras for Hispanics or um, bar mitzvahs for Jewish people, They've got rites of passages for young men going into adulthood. So it's all about God's not. But great question. So immigration. Okay, so this is Pocahontas. And here's, we're going to go a little bit more about Pocahontas. Like I said, 
Uh, the one event that's going to kind of start helping the conflict between the Powhatans and the Europeans is the marriage of Pocahontas to a white European male. Um, and she marries this guy right here. His name is John Rolfe, R-O-L-F-E, um, John Rolfe. And so, and she's young. Uh, she's about, I'd say probably 14, 15 years old when she marries him. Um, Back in your day, they didn't care how old you were. Well, it wasn't even a, they didn't care. It's just that, first of all, they didn't have a very high life expectancy. So, you know, we live now until 90, 100, and it's, you know, so you make it to 90, years. that's that's average. You make it to 100, that's like, woo, big deal, right? Um, back then, you're thinking 50, 60. I mean, if you make it to 70, you're doing really good, right? You've got a long life. You know, you probably didn't do a lot of hard work or anything like that. So why did that dude that was like 51 come? He was probably a felon. You know, and he's... And he probably didn't, and I don't know who he was. So, I mean, I don't know if his physique was one that he was really healthy and could have withstand, withstood it. He could have passed away right away. How did he spell his last name again? R O L F E, Rolf. John Rolf. So you have John Smith and John Rolf. So, this picture here. So, keep in mind, so when, when, we're reviewing for the AP test, and you go back and you look at pictures, just kind of jog your memory, because these are all primary sources for you. This one is a very famous painting, okay? So you will see this one um, throughout US history. Um, but this one here, this is their, their marriage, um, and you can see, if you were to get closer to it, um, there's some tribal members there, you can tell by their headpieces. I'm gonna venture to say that, that might be uh, the chief, her dad again, um, mixed in with other Europeans that were there. So this is the marriage. She's still dressed like herself, right? In what I would consider her traditional garb from her culture. Then we move up here. She's dressed a little bit differently. She's starting to dress more European or what we call anglicized, more white, okay? Um, this picture up here is a picture of her baptism into the Catholic Church, Christianity. Um, and if you can tell right here, in, it's in the dark, I mean, they probably did that purposefully. There's a Native American sitting right there, uh, arms crossed, heads a little down. Why do you think he might not be um, okay with what's happening here? Because it's a different um, Latin type of people. Okay, but she is. Why is he not happy for her? She's changing religion. She's Changing more than just religion. She's changing her lifestyle. Lifestyle, culture, right? She's trading who, the essence, kind of, of who she is, right? Nowadays, we when we change religions, it's not really, it's not always necessarily about changing your culture, right? We've kind of separated the two, but there are a lot of cultures that are still highly connected to religious beliefs. Um, and for these guys, like I said, Native Americans are very, I would use the word religious, but I don't know that they would use the word religious, right? Kind of have to put religious in terms of the time period. But they're very attuned into the, the gods that surround them, nature and earth and all that stuff. Um, and here she's turning to something completely. That's not her. Not her. Self. Right? Um, so this is a picture of her um, baptism. Then we're moving over here. So she's married this guy, um, and he takes her to Europe, takes her to England. She's the first Native American to visit England. Um, first one. Um, and they have, they've changed her. She dresses differently. Like, I look at that picture, I would never have even probably guessed that that was a Native American female, right? Um, pale skin, um, dress very European. Um, they actually give her an English name. They call her Rebecca. So if you see that somewhere, her name's Rebecca. Um, and so, um, and it says on here, uh, Rebecca, daughter of mighty Prince Powhatan Emperor. Uh, so this is uh, po Pocahontas. Uh, and shortly after that picture, she dies. 
she had gone to Europe. She died young. Of, yeah, she died of disease. Because, again, the same diseases that go over, Come down. if you go over never having been exposed to all those diseases that are have floated in that continent, in that area, for thousands of years, um, she she's never been, um, you know, uh, subject to it. So she actually catches smallpox first, but actually dies of measles. And for us, nowadays, that's like a common vaccine that y'all get. Y'all can't go to kindergarten without getting uh, what's called an MMR, measles, mumps, rubella. So nowadays, that's common for us. We get it when we're young. You have to get it when you enter sixth or seventh grade again, um, and we're vaccinated. Okay, what so she, die from? I mean, the she caught smallpox, mm -hmm. but died from measles. And she was about twenty-four. I should probably explain this. Uh, M E A S E L. No. M E A S. -E It's L E S. I have to think of how to write that one out. M E A S L E S. Caught smallpox, died of measles. Um, the one of the things that probably came out of her going to Europe is now that they've um, seen her in Europe and are kind of witnessing Native American, there's more of a increase of Europeans that want to come over to the New World. So that'd probably be one effect of her coming over. Um, another effect of her marriage to John Rolfe would be the easing of that conflict between the Powhatan and the Europeans. Okay? So that is Pocahontas, a.k.a. Rebecca. Um, Alright, so to make Jamestown successful. So that first manifest I told you that came over, um, a good portion of those people died um, because of malaria, disease, starvation, and exposure to the elements. Um, but to make it successful, you have Captain John Smith, and he is known for being the leader of Jamestown. He is what made Jamestown successful in, in that the guys that subsequently came over after that first ship um, were um, he'd gather them together, teach them how to do things, teach them how to clear land, teach them how to do crops, uh, teach them how to work together, all that stuff. And so his leadership is super important to Jamestown. If it wasn't for John Smith, they would not have been successful. Okay, and he's the guy in that first picture that we saw Pocahontas saving um, from her, her chief father. The other guy that's important is Pocahontas' husband, John Rolfe. There's, there's Mr. Rolfe. And he's important because he brings over a crop that is going to change the culture of that colony. Anybody know what crop he brought over? What? He brought a crop over. Wheat. Was it wheat? Was it what? Wheat. Nope. Anybody else want to try to guess? What did she say? She said corn. He said wheat. Tobacco. What? Tobacco. Tobacco. Oh, no, I thought I was Yes. Say. He brought tobacco. It was in, it was in chapter one. There you go up what you're reading, right? He brought over tobacco. And tobacco ended up being very, very successful in Virginia and Jamestown because of the climate. The climate is just amazing for that crop, that harvest. It's hot and humid. Um, you get just enough heat, just enough rain to make it work. And the soil is good. The problem, though, is that to grow tobacco, you need a lot of land because tobacco uh, I'm not a farmer but I know just a little bit um, tobacco ruins the soil and so you have to give the soil a break every year and so you rotate so if you're if you farm and you have like a hundred acres 
and you break your 100 acres into 20 acre plots, you're gonna grow maybe in three of the plots one year and then rotate to the other plots the next year to give the soil a break, heal, and then you can go back, okay? So as they're growing tobacco, what they're doing is they're finding that they need more and more land. So they're on the east coast, on the eastern uh, start, uh, seaboard there. Where do they go to expand? West. West. And who's west? With the Indians. More Native Americans, right? We aren't quite yet to make another colony, right? Yeah. Getting there, though. But you're invading other inhabited land by other Native Americans. They already encroached on the Powhatans. Now you're going to keep going westward, and that was an issue with the whole concept of manifest destiny and westward expansion, right? You're going into other people's land. Now, keep in mind, the Native Americans don't consider themselves owners of any land. They're more like caretakers. The gods gave them the land to take care of, and then, then, then in turn they're going to be blessed with, you know, game and food and stuff like that. The Europeans, we have a concept in the culture that we own the land. If we're, if possession is nine-tenths of the law, I don't know if you've ever heard that statement, but if you own it, uh, it's yours, right? And so as they come in and they, you know, take over, they think, they think that they own that land. Um, and they're just pushing the people out. So, to grow tobacco, you need good um, farming conditions, but you also need people. So before you write anything, this is the first labor system. It's called the head right system. So take your right hand, take your right hand, and touch your head. Head right. So when you're taking a test and they talk about a labor system, one labor system you're gonna remember is head right, labor system. That's called indentured servitude. Okay? So this is the first, the first labor system. We're not into slavery. This is called indentured servitude. Head right. The head right system. And each Virginian, that means each colonist that lived in Virginia, would receive 50 acres of land for every person, person's passage that they paid for. Okay, so if I'm a colonist, I'm in Virginia, and I own my 100 acres, I need people to work that land. I need people that are going to go start the, you know, work the land, start the crops, harvest the crops, um, and I may need 100 people to do that. Where am I going to find those people? I'm going to pay for their passage over. So I'm going to give money to a middleman in England, and he's going to sign people into contracts. Okay, these are Europeans. We're not talking about slavery yet. These are Europeans that one wants some freedom. Uh, they might be the second, third, fourth born son, um, and there's nothing for them in Europe. Um, maybe they're just, it's just not happening for them. They can't make a go of things in um, Europe, so they want passage over to a country that they think they can make a new living. Um, and so they sign a contract. To come over and work. They get free free passage over. They don't have to pay the fee. Um, and so you sign a contract. You sign it for um, to work anywhere from five to seven years. Doesn't sound bad, right? Five to seven years. Uh, when you finish your seven years or your five years of contract, you're promised a little bit of land and a little bit of money. So you're promised some freedoms. A little bit of land and a little bit of money. And then uh, one of the other key things is you're forbidden to marry. Now, the problem with this is if you look in here from 1610 to 1614, only one in 10 outlived their contract. Now, you have to keep in mind, you have to kind of think numbers wise, right? We're not talking like 100 guys came over and 10 guys lived. We're talking thousands came over and hundreds lived. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, but, uh, and again, they're dying because exposure, disease. I'm not used to the hard work here in the New World because it is completely different, right? Completely different. 
So indentured servitude, head right system. Hope you remember that. And it's going to be men that are coming over. So why are they forbidden to marry? Um, if they marry, it takes away from what they're going to do. And then that pers the person that holds their contract that probably houses them and everything has got to take care of that woman too. So you're act adding extra burden onto it. Um, so no, they don't want that. So this labor system, uh, two things from it. One, you're going to increase the profit of Jamestown. Tobacco is going to increase the profit of Jamestown immensely. And two, tobacco is going to lead to the plantation system. So if you've been to, the, if you've ever been to the South, uh, New Orleans over, there are huge plantations. Like, you know, you got that big Civil War antebellum type house. They're gorgeous. They're huge, right? Um, and then you've got thousands of acres of land. Um, you have tobacco like Virginia down, and then you start getting into cotton and stuff that we'll hear about more with um, African slaves um, leading into the Civil War and stuff like that. Um, but the plantation system. The bigger the piece of property, the more people you need to work it. Right? Because the person that's in charge is not the person that's out there working the land. His, his goal is to make money. And this is a system that's going to go on for several hundred years. In fact, this system was going on probably through the 1900s, early 1900s. Uh, not as big as it was here, but there are still people coming over. Uh, we'll see. Who's watched Titanic? A couple people? So Jack and his buddy at the very beginning of the movie, uh, they were dishing out on their indentured servitude. They were supposed to come over, um, if I remember the movie correctly, to come over from the New World. So um, in the 1800s, you're going to have, you're probably going to see like the Irish come over as indentured servants because uh, you have the potato famine in Ireland um, and they, they, they're just not living well in Ireland. They're not surviving. Um, so a lot of them are going to find um, sponsors to, to send them over to the New World. So this system lasts for a long time. So, all right, questions? All right, here I'm gonna move in to slavery. The first Africans in Virginia, uh, there were, it was in 1619, and the Dutch brought them. So you need to know the Dutch, 1619. They brought 20, and they didn't bring them as slaves. They started out as indentured servants. So the Dutch in 1619 brought 20 men, 20 men over. Um, and some of those men, just a few, not all of them, there was only 20-ish of them. Some of those men um, were able to successfully uh, outlive their contract or somehow find, I don't know all the details, uh, but somehow find money to buy out their contract and become free men, right? Um, what I need you to know is that they're Africans, and they in turn bought other Africans. Okay? So we automatically think slavery as white people owning Africans, right? So Africans own Africans. Yes. We have seen that in history. And the pr first one to do that is an Ang Angolan, which is in Africa, an Angolan by the name of Anthony Johnson. He's the first African... Uh, male to buy other Africans. Um, but more importantly, what I need you also to understand is that the concept of slavery goes way back in history. Way, way, way back. So if you've ever gone to Sunday school and you've heard about Joseph and uh, the Hebrews and all of them, or watched the, um, uh, there's a couple movies, cartoon movies about it, Disney movies. Um, Disney's got a lot of movies about a lot of things. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, they, make, they take real situations and turn it into cartoons. Yes, they sure do. But at that time, the Egyptians, which I don't know if you know your geography, 
but Egypt is in northern Africa, right? The Egyptians enslaved the Hebrews back in biblical times. And they enslaved them. I, I want to say that a good number of those pyramids and things that you see in Egypt were built by the Hebrews as slaves. And then they escaped at one point in time. But they were enslaved for several hundred years. Through So slavery goes way back. Right? We, we focus more of it from the 1800s forward because it affects us personally here in the United States because it became a huge issue here. But it goes way back. It's still an issue in some places. Like, even today, slavery still exists in some places today. Some people would equate today's sex trafficking as slavery. I'm kind of torn on that one because it's not, really. it's not true slavery. Like, you are tar you, kidnapping and it's a little different. It's a little different. But some people would consider it slavery um, in some form or fashion. Like, um, it's like you're like, it's still like you're like, where is today? Hmm? I can explain you still have things where they're like, where? Different little countries around the world. Not in our country. Just different spots. So, but yeah. So this, the Dutch, 1619, introduced the first African Americans to, um, to the New World. Um, couple numbers that I want you to write down. Let me make sure I have these. So, this is going to be the introduction of the uh, African slave trade route that you put on your triangular trade route maps, right? Um, and it's called the Transatlantic um, Slave Trade. Trans means over, and Atlantic is the ocean that they're going over. So, over the Atlantic o Ocean. So, during that transatlantic trade route time period, 12 million Africans were brought over as slaves. 12 million. You probably should know this. I would write these numbers down. 12 million Africans were brought over the transatlantic trade route. We're talking over a couple hundred years, not just one or two. 12 million. Of the 12 million, a little less than 5% made their way to the New World. To what we know as America. So that's about one million came to our country. Dang. What happened to the other million? What happened to the other 11 million? They died. No. Nope. Where do you think they went? They Around Brazil. They South America. South America, Brazil, South America, and the Caribbean. So, I mean, when you think about it number wise, one million versus 11 million. That is a lot. And it is a lot, right? So 11 million went to the mostly the Caribbean um, and South America. So that's a lot. So when you're talking about the Caribbean, Bahamas, Haiti, Dominican Republic, um, all those little islands, a little bit probably into Cuba, all those islands that, I mean, there's if you look at a map, there's a ton of little islands down there before you kind of hit into South America. Um, but yeah, so 12 million over a couple of hundred years um, came over, which is a lot, right? That is a lot. And yeah. Only million yeah. Somewhere else. Absolutely. Um, and one, I don't want to say benefits, but one of the benefits to the tobacco crop and using African slaves is that the climate and the crop was, was familiar to Africans. So they did really. They were very successful in being able to come over here um, and help the Europeans harvest those crops, um, and so that's why they utilized them so much because it was a familiar environment to them. They weren't having to like get used to the climate, um, and they it was the same kind of work that they were used to. Just a little bit, not just a little bit, uh, just a lot more extreme, right? A lot more extreme. Huh? Oh yeah, you worked from like sun up to sundown. You didn't, you didn't fulfill the expectations of the master. You got in trouble, right? We'll see as slavery uh, goes forward that um, it turns from at one point in time it's going to turn from indentured servitude slavery where they're just working to a, what's called a chattel system, C H A T T E L, and that's more of a 
possession system. So they go from being slaves and working to being slaves that are owned by people. Like if you are a slave and you, like at any given moment, someone could come beat you or take you away or sell you to somebody else. That's what the chattel system is. Mm -hmm. It's a possession system. You are my property, personal property. Uh, indentured servant, or servants in the early stages of slavery, they didn't consider them personal property. Um, but then we see that you know with, uh, Af uh, African women that have babies, the babies might be taken away from them. Um, we all know that a lot of women were raped or had uh, relationships with the masters, and, and they just they considered them property. They didn't consider them people, right? They didn't consider them people at all. Uh, okay, we're gonna jump up to 1624. So. If you are familiar, this flag is still used. This is called the Union Jack, that little spot up there on the left. That's the Union Jack, the British flag. Um, when it's seen on the red like this, you may also see it on, on blue. Uh, it's to indicate the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom is uh, Britain, Scotland, Ireland. It's a combination of a couple countries. It's not just Britain. But uh, 1624, Jamestown... What was known as a joint stock company now switches over to become a royal colony. A royal colony. So it's no longer a joint stock company. It's a well, it's a royal colony. And so who runs it if it's royal? The king. The king. King of England. Hmm? Royal colony. Virginia House of Burgess. That's their government system. The Virginia House of Burgess. And the reason why that was a good government system is because it's a representation system. They elected people to represent the whole. And we still use that. I'm going to go to the voting polls in November. I know you guys aren't old enough, but I expect you when I see you next year, if you're old enough to be registered to vote, right? Um, good, I like to hear that. Uh, so in November, I'm going to go to vote for people to represent me. We still have a representative type government, and it comes from here. Virginia House of Burgess, and their government system is representation. And so that is uh, their legacy that's passed down. And it's going to come into play, you know, 140, 50 years later, when we declare independence from Great Britain and we're now trying to uh, figure out how to create a new country and what type of government is gonna work well. Um, as a, yo, could you imagine being the people in the 1700s having to create an entire new government and how it's going to be successful for every person that lives in that country? That was a lot. I mean, you just think about, I mean, it is a lot of work for Mr. Lane coming back as a new principal to a high school and COVID and all that stuff. Especially his first high school. First high school. Just think, as a founding father trying to create a government for a whole stinking country, I would not want that stress. <laughs> at all. all. Not at all. And then, you know, y'all think it's just the guys, but then they were married, so then you think that stress goes right back home, right? Would not want that one bit. That is way too much. Oh, a lot of meetings and all that good stuff. So, um, so, 1624, we're a royal colony, the Virginia House of Burgess. And we're going to flip even further. Uh, 1676, about 100 years before we declare independence from Britain, we have what's called Bacon's Rebellion. Bacon's Rebellion. 
Nathaniel Bacon was an indentured servant. He had signed a contract, came over here. He is one of those people that outlived his contract. And so, like I said, when you outlive your contract as an indentured servant, you get a little bit of land and a little bit of freedom. But where did I say they give you that land at? Further, further west, right? So they're pushing him out of Jamestown, and they're pushing him further west, and they're giving him a little bit of land. So Bacon and a couple um, other, several other um, men that had uh, outlived their contracts uh, lived in this area together outside of um, Jamestown. Now, further west means that they're into more contact with other Native Americans. And so what's happening is the Native Americans are causing problems with Bacon and the people that live there. Um, and so Bacon asked the governor of Virginia at the time, William Berkeley, hey dude, can you maybe send some people out to help us? Like we need some protection. So send a couple guys out, you know, take care of it and we're good, good. He also taxed them and stuff like that. That was issues. Um, but the biggest issue was the conflict that, Ber and Berkeley was like, dude, I don't got no people, sorry. I don't know how to help you. And so, uh, Bacon and the people kept getting harassed and, and, and stuff through, by the Native Americans. So they decided to take matters into their own hand, and Bacon led his little rebellion, and they went into Jamestown, and they burned most of Jamestown down. Right, they did. Yeah, because they're like, hey, we're tired of this stuff. Um, so uh, Bacon was actually captured, he escaped, and then he ended up dying of dysentery, uh, if you're familiar with the Oregon Trail, dysentery is a disease that's very common on the Oregon Trail. It's a, a eat your insides out, causes, it's gonna sound really gross, TMI, sorry, but causes massive like diarrhea and stuff like that. Um, on the, it's so gross, but it's, that's like, like the hallmark of that disease. Um, on the Oregon Trail, they tend to get dysentery from like the alkaline water that they drink. Um, that's not good for their system, so it like messes up your system. Yeah, so um, so he kind of is an inconsequential person in history. I mean, we have a whole rebellion named after him, but he's kind of just a blip. The main thing that comes out of this is at this point in time, 1676, indentured servitude starts dropping. Okay. Because they're thinking, well, if these European men come over here, they outlive. Now, you know, things are becoming a little bit easier in the colonies, right, compared to, like, the first go-around. So people might be living a little bit longer. If these guys are outliving their contracts and they are uh, then have their own land, they're going to start rebelling. And what do we do 100 years later? We rebelled, right? Yes. So in the colonist minds that were there, especially the ones that had money, they're thinking, oh, let's, let's start going away from this and moving towards slavery. Because they're not going to rebel, right? Because we're going to have that system pretty soon, that slavery is that chattel system of a possession. And so we're going to be able to control them a lot more than we can control European indentured servants. Does that make sense? So, um, so we see bacon, um, but that's where we're going to end today. I'm hungry. You're hungry? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so let me, let me, uh, explain the test and I'll, then I'll stop the video. So the, I, and I might give you, not might, I will give you a quiz next week over chapter two and I might, here's the mic. I will give you a quiz. I might com uh, combine chapter two and three, okay? So if you do anything this weekend, you better make sure that you're reading, okay? Um, you've already done questions, but make sure you go back and review, So because I might combine two and three. So now, with your test, here's what I'm gonna do. Um, I'm going to allow you to fix, to do test corrections, okay? Um, and I will give you five points because remember I said at the beginning, I'm not giving this so that you actually pass the test. I'm doing this to help you gain a few points back. I will give you five points a question. 
So write on your test a um, couple things. Do not erase anything on here. Yes, you can do it in a different color. Do not erase anything. So here's what you're going to do. Using your book, you're going to find the question in your book. You're going to find the answer. You're going to tell me what page you found it on, what paragraph you found the answer in, and what sentence. Because these questions come straight from the book. What page, what paragraph? What yep, what page, what paragraph, what sentence. So off to the side, I would literally, in a different color or a pen, just write page such and such. 10, paragraph 2, sentence 1. Then, you can, if you're using a different color, you can circle the correct answer or write the correct letter underneath that. Writing the correct letter underneath that might be a little bit um, easier for me to read. Um, this does not go home with you today. So it is 1033, you got about 20 minutes. If you don't get it done today, try to get it done today because I want to be able to give you these points for, the progress. for the progress reports, okay? Um, and I, Y'all, I got life just like you all have a life. So I finalized my progress reports and my report cards by the time I leave here on Friday, and I do not take anything on the weekend. Okay? So if you have anything that needs to get done to me, it needs to be turned in today. You do have an essay due tomorrow, though. It won't go on progress report. Okay? I won't do that to you. But you do have an essay due, right? Yes, Right? We all remember that you have an essay in your study packet. What does it mean to be an American?